Praise the Lord, everybody. Hey, so good to be here. We're back in Orange. Yeah. I am too. You and me, we're both excited. I do, I, I do want to say thank you to everybody who just rolled with it last week. We showed up. Um, it, it was good church. We just went and had a great service and... Um, the, you know, the missionary got the name of the town wrong, but we forgive him. That guy, that guy has probably been to 20 different towns in that one week, you know, and so like we're going to, you know, if he, gets it, if he gets it wrong once in a while, I could totally understand. That's our next spot. We're, we're headed. As soon as we find it, we're going to go there. Well, I mean... You never know these hills. You just keep driving. You could be in Canada before you know it. No, that was good. It was all very wonderful. And I'm just, I'm proud of our folks. We can just show up and be us wherever we go. And I know you were ready to come here with your winter coat on and your hat and your mittens and your long johns and all that. But we didn't have to. The heat's on. So praise God. Which, you know, I thought when I, got the, when I got the message that you all got this morning, I thought, oh, this is perfect because I'm going to preach about rejection yes. and, uh, <laughs> you know, how to just keep moving forward, basically. And I'm like, all right, well, I guess maybe if we have to sit around and shiver together, then it'll be perfect, you know. But thank God we get to be warm instead. I'll take that. Let's get, let's get to the lesson, though. Today we're going to open the Bible. We're going to go to Luke chapter 4. We'll start in verse 16. And together we'll read verse 16 to 19, Luke 4, 16 through 19. Um, but we're going to keep, we're going to stay in that chapter for the next 30 minutes. Okay, so like a lot of us like to slam our Bible shut, but maybe you'll read along with me because I'm just going to refer back to, we're going to continue on after verse 19 later. I won't make you stand and read that whole section though. That seems like a lot of work. So Luke 4, 16 through 19. So he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah, and when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Jesus, I just want to pray real quick while we're all here standing together. God, I just want to ask, unify us. Help us, Lord, as we go through a Bible study together to have ears to hear what you're trying to say to us. Help me to do a good job. Yes, Lord, but I want you to help my brothers, my sisters. My friends who are here today, help us, God, to each of us really connect with your mind today, God, because, Lord, you're our teacher. You're our Savior. You, Lord God, sent your spirit into our hearts and into this place, God, to bring us life and that more abundantly. God, have your way here today, I pray, in the name of the Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord God. Amen. You could be seated if you like. Man, it is good to pray with the church. I love it. I could just keep going, but I want to get through this lesson with you, so we're going to do it. In this lesson, we're going to look at it in three parts. In each of the parts, there'll be a section of Scripture that goes with it. Uh, the topic, really, is not being stopped by rejection. So the first part, we kind of read it. Jesus went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. The second part's going to be God has promises for the Gentiles, which is everybody who's not a Jew, as well as Israel. And the third part is... Though many rejected Jesus, he continued to do God's will. And that third part, you know, I'm hoping when we get there, we can really relate to the Lord. God didn't do anything accidental or impulsively. He never said anything just casually or flippantly. Every word he uttered, every action that was recorded was done on purpose. And it was sometimes for our teaching, oftentimes to rebuke or to motivate us to get better. And a lot of times to be an example to us of how we should do it. He, uh, in this chapter, gives us an example of a lot of things. In the, in the first part, we read how when he came to Nazareth, that happened to be where he was born, where he had grown up, where all the people who knew him by name, knew mom and dad and brothers and sisters and whoever else might have been around, 
he was known there. That was his hometown. And when he went there, he was, as his custom was, he went to the synagogue. Now, what we, what we might not know, maybe we do, but what we might not know was a synagogue was kind of the next, um, the next version of God's temple that you read about in the Old Testament. When it says synagogue, well, wasn't the temple in Jerusalem? Yes, but they worshipped all over the place. And in those places of worship, they were called the synagogue. Those were places of teaching, et cetera, et cetera. And so when Jesus went there, he was handed the book of the scroll, and then he, then he read that part from Isaiah, which I love. He explains why the Spirit of the Lord is upon him, to bring us liberty, to, to anoint, uh, to, to, you know, to bring sight to the blinded eyes, and to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to, and to free, and to heal, and to on and on and on. This, I have the Spirit of the Lord upon me because... So first of all, I'd just like to tell you, saint of God, if you have been born again of the water and the spirit, God gave you his spirit for a reason. It's not just upon you. Now, we can feel his presence around us and his spirit moving on us. Anybody can, anyone. The Bible says that he poured out his spirit on all flesh. So anybody can feel his presence. Anybody can feel the touch of the Lord. Anybody can even be moved by God. But we who have been blessed, who have received a revelation from the word of God and understand what it means to be saved, those of us who have repented of our sins and been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, like the scripture says, and have been filled with his spirit, like the scripture says, those of us, we don't just have his spirit upon us, it is in us, and it is is not in us for no reason. It is in us because, just like Jesus said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because. He gave us His Spirit for a reason. You ever try to do anything athletic or particularly agile or something, you know, really deft with your hands and just completely blow it right in front of somebody? I'm so embarrassed. I, the, the one thing I keep thinking about is I, I, maybe you've been with, been with me in this situation. You know, you're on a crosswalk, get, get all the busy traffic to stop, and you go to jog across the road, and then you eat pavement right in front of everybody. I've done that, okay? And so then you have to try to find a way. How do I make this look like I meant to do it? It's really hard to make it look like stumbling and falling and eating the pavement was an intentional act. You ever, like... You ever really wanted something, kids, or when you were a kid and you went, you went, maybe as an adult, you went to get that pay raise or you went, there, or, you know, as a child, you really want, can, you know, I've got to go to, I want to go to my friend's house. So I put, put together the best sales pitch that I've got. I put together, you know, every rational excuse for why you should let me go and do this thing and get shot down hard. Bam. No way, Jose. Are you nuts? Or maybe got laughed at or scoffed at. I remember applying for a job as a young man and telling the guy what I wanted for a wage and having him just laugh with his mouth hanging open in my face. That was rough. Can you think of a time a door was slammed in your face, either literally, hopefully not, or figuratively? Just an opportunity, and you're like, yes, my time is now. Bam! Each of us have probably had situations like that that rise up in our lives or have risen up in our lives, you know, once bitten, twice shy, right? And so, like, all these situations, I'm trying to get us to kind of emotionally connect with the idea that you've probably been rejected in your life. And if not, praise God, you're doing really well. You're going to be rejected at some point. Either that or you're just, all you do is sit in your chair and you never move and you never talk to anybody. You can't live life without facing rejection. It's kind of, I want to get that out of the way right at the beginning of this lesson. We're going to be, if we have not already been rejected or have some kind of dramatic failure, be embarrassed or something like that that really shuts you down in your forward progress. It's going to happen or it has happened. But what usually happens to a lot of us is we go, you know what, that's not for me. I'm just never going to do that again. I, you know, I've seen folks in church, like, I want to sing a special, and they get up, and they squawk and blow it bad, and they'll never sing again, and I think that's a shame. Not that they squawked and that they sung badly, but that they don't ever want to give it another try. 
uh, some of the most moving songs I've heard in church were by people who have no singing talent whatsoever. It's not about how pretty or beautiful you sound. That's why I still lead worship around here. It's about, it's about the heart that's behind it and your love for the Lord and his love moving through you. It's about leading in worship as an example of worship. But I know people, and I could name them, I don't want to embarrass them, who said, I'm never doing that one again. And it's a shame because you see rejection or failure is, is that's just a thing that happens to all of us. And that's no reason for you to not just keep moving forward. Don't be stopped by rejection. That's today's lesson. As Christians, we can get frustrated by that t- tension, you know, that pressure. I want to be a good witness in this world. I want to tell my coworker about Jesus. I want to invite so-and-so to Bible study. I want to, you know, I want to share what I'm reading about or what I'm hearing about. I want to send somebody that link to YouTube. I want to invite somebody to church. I want to do these things. And I, and so many of us, especially the longer we're at it, so many of us have literally had doors slammed in our faces over this. So many of us have been laughed at or mocked or even made an enemy out of somebody who once was a friend or even a family member as we try to live a God example around people that we love and that we care about or that we respect. It has happened or it will happen. That's part of being a Christian. And just as sad as it makes me that that person will never try to sing in front of people again, it makes me more sad to know that there are some of us today who have tried and failed, so to speak, or tried and had the door slammed on us and let it stop us from trying again. Don't let rejection be something that stops you from trying again. Jesus faced rejection. We only opened with what he did and what he said at the beginning. But you see, in verse 20 of Luke 4, we continue the story. It says, he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So all bore witness to him and marveled at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, is this not Joseph's son? Look, this is Jesus, the one who's going to save his people from their sins. Oh, isn't this just Joseph's kid? He he said to them, you will surely say this proverb to me. Physician, heal yourself. Whatever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in your country. Then he said, assuredly, I say to you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. He was trying to say something that just feels real to a lot of us, that people who know you, when you try to show them a changed life, when you try to show them the example of what God has done to transform you into the image and the likeness of Christ. I talked about being transformed recently. When you begin to live that for the first time, especially around the people who know you the most, they begin to scoff and go, wait a minute, Isn't that just Eileen? I know Eileen from way back. That's not Eileen. Isn't that just Tammy? Isn't that just Jacob? Wait a second. What what are they playing at? Are they pretending? Do they think they're holier than thou? Are they just trying to act righteous in front of me? I've seen the things they do. I've heard the things they used to say. And they want to see the you that you used to be. And they want to refuse to see the you that you have become. Now, we have Jesus who was born perfect, sinless, never never blew it, never ate it, never ran around. As far as we know, in all of Scripture, there's no, there's no way you could possibly say that God in flesh sinned ever. And here he comes with authority, reading the Scripture, saying, today, this has come to pass. The Spirit is on me to set you free. And they wonder, and they marvel, and they look at him like, Wow. But it's not, wow, I'm changed. Wow, I'm motivated. Wow, I'm, I'm encouraged. It's, wow, isn't this just Joseph's kid? Isn't this just a carpenter's son? He faced rejection, as do we. And he didn't let it stop him. Not even one little bit. He even said, guess what? You're going you're gonna to continue to do that. He, he was predicting the things that would be said of him and to him, what would be spat at him on the cross, basically, when he was saying, healer, heal yourself. You're going to tell me these things. And then he mentions Capernaum. And then he says, assuredly, I say to you, no prophet is accepted. The King James used to say, a prophet is not without honor, except in his own household or his country. Sometimes familiarity breeds contempt. That used to be a saying. And they used to teach this in leadership and stuff and in business. And I don't think it's a good 
good thing necessarily, but they try to tell leaders, you know, you can't be too close to the people you're leading because they won't respect you. And if they don't respect you, they won't follow you. I don't agree with that at all, but it comes from this same thing. It comes from the idea that a prophet is not without honor unless he's around people who know him. Familiarity can breed contempt. But here's the challenge to you and to me. A, we're being challenged to reach out to people that we have relationship with. It doesn't make sense to just try to preach the gospel to strangers. They don't care what you know until they know that you care. And how do they know that you care unless you have some kind of relationship with them? The people who, who reached into my life and encouraged me to get involved in this thing called Christianity, the people who stuck it out with me and, and helped me on through, they were people that cared about me and I knew it. And it gave them leverage in my life. It gave them something to pry my butt out of the seat on a Sunday when the Super Bowl is on and go to church anyway. Amen. It takes relationship. Amen. And so you could say familiarity breeds contempt, but you know what? We are God's own special people. And they're not going to see how special it is what God does in us if we cannot be real and if we cannot really embrace this great salvation in front of people, I will fall, but don't rejoice over me when I fall, for I will rise up again. Amen. That's Old Testament, but it's still the Word of God. Yep. We must be careful, though, not to be too familiar with Jesus our own selves, with the move of God in church services. Familiarity could breed contempt. Right. In church the Spirit of the Lord. We prayed for just a few moments at the start of this lesson. I felt His Spirit moving. God, I hope I never lose that Amen. ever. When I pray together with you, when I pray in my home, I want that every single time. But we can get used to that. You can get used to that. Maybe you were sitting in church already and you haven't felt a thing. And there's different reasons for that. But you know what? We can take for granted the grace and the blessing of the Lord. You can take for granted this word, oh, we're reading the bread again. This, I mean, I've read the Bible through 15,000 times. Pr doubt it. But you say that, you know, man, are we the same, the same thing every year. Yeah, but you know what? God shows me something new every time I open the book because I'm looking for something new every time I open the book. You, you find what you look for. If we come expecting, oh, my old buddy Jesus, we could take for granted what he's really trying to do in our lives every single time. Every time we gather in church on a Sunday is another opportunity, and it's a powerful one. It's more than ritual. It's more than church service. It's more than a meeting. It's more than a gathering. It is our escape from sin, our deliverance to heaven. It's our empowerment, and it's our calling. It's our relationship. It's we come to go isn't just a calling for us to say, wake up, sleepy. It's we come in here and something tangible and real happens in our hearts and in our minds and in our lives in such a way that we can get up and we can face another rejection. I can see another door slammed in my face because when I come here on Sunday, every door is open. When I come here, every face is looking at me with love. When I come here, I can be embraced by a brother and by a sister in real love because we're bound together by the Holy Spirit. No manipulation no flattery. We're looking out for each other here. And so when we come to go, that's what that means. I come here and I get stuff that I need and that I know the world desperately needs. You see, but if I just let this turn into some sort of ritual and some same old, same old thing, oh, they're singing that song again? Oh, Brother Russell's teaching again? Oh, man, I'm just going to flip to another channel in my mind for the next 30 minutes. Don't fall into that same trap. You you know, Lucifer fell from heaven, the presence of Almighty God, and he fell in his pride. He got too familiar and too contemptuous of God and his value in his life, and that is why he is cast out. He basically said, I don't need this guy. I don't want this. I'm good enough on my own, and he turned his back, and in doing so, fell like lightning from heaven. Adam and Eve were in the closest thing we've had on this planet to heaven, and they both fell. 
Familiarity could breed contempt. The warning to this Christian, the warning to us all is don't take for granted the great things that we've been given in the house and in the family of God. Pastor just talked to us about Esau despising his birthright. Esau wept bitterly, wanting to change what had happened, wanting somehow to take it all back when he had sold his birthright and when he had lost the blessing of his father, but he could not find it. But he didn't care about it when it was still in his grasp. That was the problem. Once it was gone, he missed it dearly. But while he had it, he took it for granted. Christian, don't take for granted the great treasures that come in the house and in the family of God, in the kingdom of God. You might recall I talked about being hungry for the things of God. And maybe when I was preaching about being hungry, or maybe that time I followed it up by preaching about staying curious, you're like, well, how? Or like, you know, how do I connect with this in my life? And this may not, this lesson may not answer it, but this could give you, you know, an, you know an, a definite, an exhortation or a warning perhaps that maybe when you lose the hunger for the things of God, it comes from being too familiar in the wrong way. We're supposed to be close to our Jesus. We're supposed to be friends of God. I don't call you servants anymore, Jesus said, but I call you friends because servants don't know what their master is doing, but friends do. Those are the words of Jesus. And so we're supposed to have a closeness and a connection. He said, I stand at the door and I knock. If anybody will open the door, I will come in, I will dine with them, and they will dine with me. He wants us. You know, there's a coming a day people will say, Lord, Lord, didn't we do this in your name? Didn't we do that in your name? And he will say, depart from me. I never knew you. We're supposed to be close to our Lord, but we can't be close and neglect to value what we've got in that relationship with God. And so maybe a way to reconnect with being hungry for the things of God, maybe a way for you and I to avoid having the same sin of Esau and despising our birthright, this great blessing that was given us the day we were born again, maybe a way to do that is to reconnect and to continually reconnect with praise and with worship. Because when you praise God, you're making him bigger in your heart and your mind. And when real praise and real worship starts to come out of you, it, you it's, you're actually realizing the things that make him valuable in your life. You're not just saying words that you're reading on a screen. And if you've been in church long enough, you can recognize that time when people start going past reading words in a song to feeling the words of the song. He puts a song in our heart, the Bible says. And so praise and worship are a way to say, God, I want to be as close to you as ever and more and more and more until that day you call me home. But God, I've got to realize this is valuable. This is precious. This is important. And the way, and a way, a way I can continue and a way I can grow in that is to embrace praise and worship in my life. I've got to lift him up. I've got to glorify his name. You see, God's not some egomaniac who needs to be puffed up. He instituted praise and worship because he knew how much we needed it so that we wouldn't become familiar with the things of God and despise our birthright. Oh, isn't this just Joseph's son? He's so much more than that. But because of that, the Bible says he couldn't do mighty things in certain places. The Bible says because of their lack of faith. Some people just want to sit around and enjoy hearing about what God can do, but aren't really motivated to embrace what God will do in me and in you. There's a difference. I want to hear all about the great things of God. I want to hear about miracles. I love when missionaries come and tell me about all the amazing, you know, blessings of salvation all around the world. And it gets me, you know, real jazzed. It's so wonderful and all of that. But man, it should get me jazzed to see it happen in my life and in your life and in my church and in your church. God, don't just do it somewhere else and don't just let me hear about somebody else being blessed. Don't let my pastor, don't let, you know, some brother or sister be the only one that brings somebody into the kingdom and watches them grow up and become somebody who adds to the kingdom. Don't let them be the only ones who are really living that kind of life that God chooses to bless. Let me be that one too. And that takes a little bit of not letting rejection stop me. 
You see, because Jesus had a mission to do when he went into that synagogue. It was just part of that mission, and they shut him down, and so he just moved on to the next place and took care of business. If I want the great things of God, I cannot let another slam door stop me. I'll just let it tell me, well, that door is shut. I'm going to move on to the next. I'm going to keep going. What did you say a while back, Sister Griggs? Knock the dust off your shoes and keep going. God has promises for all of us. You see, in verse 25, he says, I tell you truly, many, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elijah when the heaven was shut up for three years and six months, and there was a great famine throughout all the land. But to none of them was Elijah sent except Zarephath in the region of Sidon to a woman who was a widow. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. So all those in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath and rose up and thrust him out of the city. And they led him to the brow of the hill on which their city was built, that they might throw him down over the cliff. Then passing through the midst of them, Jesus went his way. Didn't get to chuck him off the ledge that time. Jesus was trying to say, you guys, you're not accepting the word. You're not accepting what God wants to do right here and right now in your life. And he reminded them from their own precious Old Testament verses of times where God went and did miracles with the people who were not the children of Abraham. He went to the widow's house, and she had plenty through the time of famine while all of Israel was suffering through famine and starvation. He sent the prophet and his servant to Naaman, a Syrian, not an Israelite, and Naaman was cleansed from his leprosy while all the lepers in the nation of Israel were not healed. He pointed out to them that, you know, when you reject the prophet of God and when you turn from the things of God, you're going to miss out on the blessings of God, but anybody who will turn to them is plenty welcome. We could go through all the New Testament, through the Gospels and on, and we can see again and again and again that people who decided, I'm going to love you, God, there was times where they'd say, God, you know, you're calling me a dog because I'm not allowed to eat at the table here that you've set for the Israelites. But even the dogs can have crumbs, Lord. And he said, I haven't seen faith like this in my own nation. And he blesses that person. Jesus again and again and again shows us that it takes faith in Christ and not pedigree. And it doesn't matter what color you are. And it doesn't matter what creed you are, what part of the world you're from. It doesn't matter your wealth or your status, your intelligence or lack thereof, that if you come to God in faith, then he will bring those blessings for you. He has promises for all. I was talking about walking in the steps of faithful Abraham recently. If we walk in his steps of faith, we have the inheritance of those promises. That's walking in faith, believing that God will do it for you and do it in you, trusting him and obeying his word and not worrying about all of that other stuff that goes with it. Oh God, help us to continue to be people of faith, but also Lord, help us to look at everyone we see as somebody eligible to receive the blessings of God. We cannot pick and choose God sends us to who he chooses, and we just go. I, if I'm choosing to believe his promises, that's part of it. It's choosing to say, God, I will go. And maybe I don't like them. Maybe they don't like me. But if you're telling me to tell them, then I will do it. Maybe I'm afraid of them. Maybe they intimidate me. Maybe their status is higher than mine or way, way lower than mine. But I'll go if that's where you're sending me to go. That's believing in the promises of God. Jesus again and again showed us he went to the people that were cast out and the dregs of society. And the only reason, not the only, but a big reason was they were the ones who were going to accept him. All the political folks and all the rulers and all the powerful people shunned him again and again and again, refused him and argued with him again and again and again. But those who embraced him, he'd lay hands on them and they'd receive sight. He'd come to them and their leprosy would be gone. He'd take them from the grave and bring them back to life again and again and again. Some people are content with merely hearing about God 
I want us to not be settle for that. I want more. I want more. Finally, I got to get to the close here. And he looked 431. He went down to Capernaum, that place he mentioned in the synagogue, city of Galilee. And he was teaching them on the Sabbaths. And they were astonished at his teaching, for his word was with authority. Now in the synagogue there was a man who had a spirit of an unclean demon, and he cried out with a loud voice saying, Let us alone! What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Reminding him where he comes from, pointing out, Isn't this just Joseph's son? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are. Ooh, wait a second. The Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. And when the demon was thrown out of him in their midst, it came out of him, and it did not hurt him. And they were all amazed and spoke among themselves, saying, What a word this is! For with authority and power he commands the unclean spirits, and they come out. And the report about him went out into every place in the surrounding region. Jesus, in his hometown, around people that he grew up with, that should have loved him and wanted to see him shine like a star, was shot down hard and was just, no way. No, you shouldn't be talking like this, Jesus. You're just Joseph's son. No way. You shouldn't act like that, Cole. You're just McAllister. You just live in Barrie, Vermont. You shouldn't act like that. You're just a part of this team. No, no, no. You see, don't let rejection shut you down and stop you. Jesus said, you're going to hear about the next city I go to, and I would have done good things here, but you weren't ready. I'm not going to let your no, I'm not going to let your stop sign stop me. I'll turn on my blinker, and I'll move on, and something good is going to happen. We've got to keep Keep moving forward, church, and that's part of it. But it, we just got to risk hearing no. You got to keep hearing no until you hear yes from somebody. You got to keep pressing on. We come to go, and that's how we go. We go like Jesus went. Jesus' ministry was characterized by biblical teaching and miraculous power with confirmation, with the Spirit confirming what he was saying with his words. Paul said, I don't want to come to people with the words of man, with man's wisdom, but with a manifestation of the Holy Spirit and with power. When you go, if you go in faith, if you go with the Word of God, if you're doing what God asks you to do, then you've got to believe that power will go with you. What you say and what you do, God will back you up. If you're doing what God sent you to do, God will back you up. Face rejection. Don't let it discourage you. Stumble in the street and get up. I didn't stop crossing the roads for the rest of my life just because I ate pavement in front of strangers. I got up and I crossed the road again. And I think we all would do the same thing. This is no harder, folks. It just feels like it. Muhammad Ali said, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. I think Pastor used that quote a while ago. No, it was Mike Tyson. Sorry, not Muhammad Ali. Muhammad, he was mouthy too, but that's different. Um, Mike Tyson. Now, these heavyweight boxer types, they could punch you so hard that you're going to see heaven. Like, it's lights out. You're done. I mean, they hit like trucks, these guys. They're, and I, they've just got mass, and they've got the right... You know, everything that I don't have, those guys hit like nobody's business. And he, that's why he said it. Everybody's got a plan until they get punched in the mouth. You get hit by a heavyweight, and you're going to want to crawl back home and get into your blanket and yeah. never come out ever again. We make our plans, right? Okay, God, I'm going to do it. This, this week, Monday, I'm going to wake up, and I'm just going to be raring to go, and I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it, and then you're going to get punched in the mouth. But you see, the ones who beat the Mike Tysons of the world are the ones who take the hit, get up off the mat, try again. Keep moving forward. In theory, there's no difference between theory and practice. In practice, there is. We can't keep sitting around thinking about how we're going to share this. And we can't just keep sitting around talking about what the church needs to do and where the mission needs to go. And you know what would be great if blah, blah, blah happened and this and that. Talking is great and planning is cool, but you never know until you get out and start doing. Here's something, too, that we don't always love to tell folks. But when you're, when you're first born again, you're about as close to perfect as 
you've ever been. And you get filled with that spirit of God and you start living for the Lord and nothing bad ever happens to you. Nope, actually. In fact, I think this happens for every saint of God. You're going to get punched in the mouth. And what happens sometimes is we take that as a, as a sign and we go, oh, that hurt. I don't ever want to face that one again. Guess I'll give up and go home. I'll take my toy and I'll leave. Don't do that. That's life. What we forget is we took shots before we got to this. That's just life. But you see, once you realize, once you take that shot as a Christian, once you take that first blow, once that loved one says, you're nuts. I don't want anything to do with what's going on in your life. Actually, don't ever talk to me again. Once you have family leave, once you have folks say, we don't, oh, why did you stop inviting me to the get-togethers? Uh, they start making excuses and stuff like that. Once you deal with those kinds of rejection and say, you know what? That's fine. That's fine. God, my God, loves me. And he gave me more than what I'm losing already. And he will give me more, and he will give me more, and he will give me more. This is no sacrifice. I'm sorry to see you go. I wish you would join me, yes. But I'm not going to let rejection say, nope, time to give up and come back home and be like you are. I know better. There's a reason I came to this. There's a reason you're here. There's a reason you're looking and you're talking to God today. And that reason is as valid today, and it will be the same tomorrow. It doesn't matter how hard you get hit. It doesn't change the fact. So don't worry about it. You're going to take a punch in the mouth. Just get up. Just get up and keep living for Jesus because it's going to get better. It's going to be all right. I'm going to end. I found a poem. Blame me for finding poems. I, I love poetry. It's actually a parable. Some fishermen I still hope God will call me to the fishing ministry. It hasn't happened yet. <laughs> Some fishermen pulled a bottle from the deep. It held a piece of paper with these words. Somebody save me. I'm here. The ocean cast me on this desert island. I'm standing on the shore waiting for help. Hurry. I'm here. One fisherman says, there's no date. I bet it's already too late anyway. It could have been floating for years. The next one says, and he doesn't say where. It's not even clear which ocean. The last one said, it's not too late or too far. The island here is everywhere. They all felt awkward. No one spoke. That's how it goes with universal truths. I want us to be the third fisherman. It's not too late. It's not too far. It's not too hard. Rejection stings, but I've been stung by bees before, probably will be again. The island, that one stranded is here and there. Williamstown and Barry, Orange, Randolph, every town, every building I walk into, every store I visit, every face I see is somebody standing on the shore. And whether they know it or not, they're saying, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. Somebody come and somebody please save me. Here I am. Somebody please come. I want to be the third one. I don't want to say, oh, but it's too dark out there. And Vermont, yes, you're on the top of the list of unchurched states in the country and unreligious people and one of the most liberal and atheistic places to be. That doesn't matter to the mission that God gave to me, and it doesn't matter to the heart that he's trying to grow in me. Everyone out there is somebody crying, I am here, and I don't care if I get rejected on Monday, Tuesday, I want to wake up ready to try again for somebody else. So today, let's not be stopped by rejection. Amen. Let's take a break before our next service in Jesus' name.